Let's continue Unit 4 with Lesson 12, Problems with the Articles, and we see from our only teaks this time that we can summarize the strengths and weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. So let's begin. To review from Lesson 11, 1776 saw the 13 British colonies break away, become independent, and declare themselves the United States of America. They established the first government of that country called the Articles of Confederation. It was a weak national government that left most powers to the individual states. Because having just left Britain and broken away from what they considered a tyrannical British government, the last thing they wanted to do was to establish a tyranny here at home. Now this government had a number of successes. It fought and won the Revolutionary War. It uh, made the Treaty of Paris with Britain ending that war. It passed the Land Ordinance of 1785 to sell the Northwest Territory in pieces and created the Township System and it passed the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which was a plan to add new states to the Union, which would become very important to the nation's future as it expanded West. However, as we predicted in Lesson 11, uh, this new government with some of its weaknesses was probably going to run us into some problems, and sure enough, it did. So let's look at those. The first one here of no revenue. This new government had no power to tax, which meant that it had no way to raise money to run the government. Now, they could go to the states to ask for money, but the states were not required to give anything to the national government. Also, the system of mercantilism had left the, uh, the United States with a shortage of hard gold and silver currency. So the Confederation government printed paper money, but without gold and silver to back it up, this money was almost worthless, so the states began to make their own. So here we see examples of $5 and $10 bills printed by the states of the state of North Carolina. So we have different types of currency in circulation, the, uh, the continental currency and the individual states. Then let's look at trade issues. First of all, the, the states put taxes on each other's goods. And like we said, the articles really treated these almost like 13 little mini countries. And they sometimes behaved like this, particularly in trade. And so there was no national enforcement of trade laws. When states had disputes over trade and fought each other, there was no national court to come between them to settle those disputes. And also, the states had different trade policies toward foreign countries. So a foreign country doing business with the United States had the, the, the rules changed depending on which state they were trading with. And this made, again, uh, made it very difficult to do trade. And all of this together, the fact that Congress did not have the power to raise money or to control its own trade, made Congress look weak to foreign countries and gave them a lack of respect and confidence in the new American government. Then, of course, there's the issue of politics. According to the Articles of Confederation, no new laws could be passed without a minimum two-thirds votes, which required the vote of nine out of 13 states. And amending the Articles, making any changes to them, required a unanimous vote. In other words, like it says here, 13 and 0 are no go. Now, knowing what we learned about the different regions and the different states back when we studied colonial regions, do you think it was reasonable that all of those states, some large, some small, some agricultural, some with industry, some with slaves, and some without, that all of those states could come together to agree on a unanimous decision, much less a two-thirds vote? So why do you think that might have been a difficult way for them to, uh, for them to pass laws? Think about that and make an answer in your notes. Now this is going to come to a head in, 1780, in late 1786 with a crisis for farmers. Uh, the states are deep in debt from the cost of the Revolutionary War and have not been able to pay these off yet. In order to do this, the state of Massachusetts raised taxes on farmers. In some, case, in some cases, the taxes were actually more than the total income of most farm families. And these farmers risked the loss of their land or could be sent to debtor's prison if they did not pay. And when the farmers went to the national government to help them or to re give them some kind of relief from this Massachusetts tax, uh, the national government had no way to do that. So in the fall of 18 1786, anger and protest are growing among these farmers until Shays' Rebellion. In January 1787, Daniel Shays, a Massachusetts farmer and veteran of the Revolutionary War, led a farmer's result revolt against the Massachusetts state government. And just like we saw back in the, the Revolutionary War, uh, this, this uh, farmer's militia attempted to seize weapons and to establish an arsenal. 
There was no Continental Army. The Continental Army had been disbanded at the end of the war, so Boston merchants used their own funds to hire a private militia to put down the rebellion. And so by February, most of the rebellion had been broken up, but the people were actually more sympathetic with the farmers instead of the government. So what was the result of this, and why was Shays' Rebellion important? Well, first of all, Shays and most of the rebellion leaders, while they were tried and convicted of treason, they were later pardoned, so they were really not, there were not any uh, severe punishments. But people began to lose confidence and have fear for America's future. And Shays' Rebellion showed the weaknesses of the Articles government. The fact that without the ability to control trade or to raise more revenue, that the country had to have a stronger national government if it, was, if it was going to survive. So as a result of this, Congress agreed to send delegates to Philadelphia in May 1787 to revise, which means to make changes to the Articles of Confederation. So our Lesson 12 Thoughts. Number one, if you'll briefly summarize three successes and three weaknesses of the Confederation government. Number two, think back to the three colonial regions we learned about and why do you think the failure of the Articles was predictable? So explain your answer. We discussed that a little bit in the video. And number three, this is kind of a judgment call on your part, do you think history should remember Daniel Shays as a traitor or a hero to the U.S.? Think about and defend your choice. And that's going to bring us to our next lesson, the Constitutional Convention, and that's a big one, guys, a very important lesson, so we'll see you then.